Hello and welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey. My name is Art and we are exploring my bookshelves. And today uh, we're looking at another short story for this month's Victorian shorts. Now every month I want to be sharing with you some of my favorite uh, Victorian stories. And uh, today is no exception. Uh, we'll be looking at the science fiction section of my bookshelf today. And I'll be reading for you H.G. Wells's The Stolen Bacillus. So just in case you don't know, like I didn't, uh, a bacillus is a type of bacteria. And that's what the story involves today. Now, perhaps you're familiar with H.G. Wells. He's written such classic works like The War of the Worlds or The Invisible Man, The Time Machine. He is considered the grandfather of science fiction. He also wrote quite a few delightful short stories. And the one I'm going to read today involves a bacteriologist and an anarchist. And as the anarchist learns of the power of just one vial of cholera, the impact it can have on a, on a major metropolis, the vial goes missing. This story is at turns comedic, but also carries a message, a warning, if you will of the power that bacteria has, especially in the hands of a madman. Well, lest I spoil how the story ends, perhaps we should get to it. H.G. Wells was born in 1866, and he died in 1946. He was considered um, a later Victorian, and this story was first published in 1895, so that's right at the end of the Victorian era. I have read many of his novels and short stories, and in spite of their age, I have really enjoyed many of them. And uh, today's story is no exception. I actually first came across The Stolen Bacillus uh, last year during Victober. It was in a collection of H.G. Wells' short stories that I read for the month. Read it and knew I had to share it with uh, all of you. Perhaps this is a story that will hit a little too close to home, considering we're just coming out of, or in some ways are still in, a pandemic, but I think you'll appreciate the story today. Now, I'll come back at the end of the story to wrap up a few thoughts I have, so I invite you to make yourself comfortable, if you can, and I'll read to you The Stolen Bacillus by H.G. Wells. The Stolen Bacillus by H.G. Wells This again, said the bacteriologist, slipping a glass slide under the microscope, is a preparation of the celebrated bacillus of cholera, the cholera germ. The pale man peered down under the microscope. He was evidently not accustomed to that kind of thing and held a limp white hand over his disengaged eye. I see very little, he said. Touch the screw, said the bacteriologist. Perhaps the microscope is out of focus for you. Eyes vary so much, just the fraction of a turn this way or that. Ah, now I see, said the visitor, not so very much to see after all, little streaks and shreds of pink, and yet those little particles, those mere atomies, might multiply and devastate a city. Wonderful! He stood up and, releasing the glass slip from the microscope, held it in his hand towards the window. Scarcely visible, he said, scrutinizing the preparation. He hesitated. Are these alive? Are they dangerous now? Those have been stained and killed, said the bacteriologist. I wish, for my own part, we could kill and stain every one of them in the universe. I suppose, the pale man said with a slight smile, that you scarcely care to have such things about you in the living, in the active state? On the contrary, we are obliged to, said the bacteriologist. Here, for instance. He walked across the room and took up one of several sealed tubes. Here is the living thing. This is a cultivation of the actual living disease bacteria. He hesitated. Bottled cholera, so to speak. A slight gleam of satisfaction appeared momentarily in the face of the pale man. It's a deadly thing to have in your possession, he said, devouring the little tube with his eyes. The bacteriologist watched the morbid pleasure in his visitor's expression. This man who had visited him that afternoon with a note of introduction from an old friend, interested him from the very contrast of their dispositions. The lank black hair and deep gray eyes, the haggard expression and nervous manner, the fitful yet keen interest of his visitor 
where a novel change from the phlegmatic deliberations of the ordinary scientific worker with whom the bacteriologist chiefly associated. It was perhaps natural, with a hearer evidently so impressionable to the lethal nature of his topic, to take the most effective aspect of the matter. He held the tube in his hand thoughtfully. Yes, here is the pestilence imprisoned. Only break such a little tube as this into a supply of drinking water? Say to these minute particles of life that one must need stain and examine with the highest powers of the microscope even to see, and that one can neither smell nor taste? Say to them, go forth, increase and multiply and replenish the cisterns. And death, mysterious, untraceable death, death swift and terrible, death full of pain and indignity, would be released upon this city and go hither and thither seeking his victims. Here, he would take the husband from the wife, here, the child from its mother, here, the statesman from his duty, and here, the toiler from his trouble. He would follow the water mains, creep along streets, picking out and punishing a house here and a house there where they did not boil their drinking water, creeping into the wells of the mineral water makers, getting washed into salad and lying dormant in ices. He would wait ready to be drunk in those horse troughs and by unwary children in the public fountains. He would soak into the soil to reappear in springs and wells at a thousand unexpected places. Once start him at the water supply, and before we could ring him in and catch him again, he would have decimated the metropolis. He stopped abruptly. He had been told rhetoric was his weakness. But he is quite safe here, you know, quite safe. The pale-faced man nodded. His eyes shone. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> uh, these anarchist rascals, said he, are fools, blind fools, to use bombs when this kind of thing is attainable. I think... A gentle rap, a mere light touch of the fingernails, was heard at the door. The bacteriologist opened it. Just a minute, dear, whispered his wife. When he re-entered the laboratory, his visitor was looking at his watch. I had no idea I had wasted an hour of your time, he said. Twelve minutes to four. I ought to have left here by half past three. But your things were really too interesting. No, positively, I cannot stop a moment longer. I have an engagement at four. He passed out of the room, reiterating his thanks. And the bacteriologist accompanied him to the door, and then returned thoughtfully along the passage to his laboratory. He was musing on the ethnology of his visitor. Certainly the man was not a Teutonic type, nor a common Latin one. A morbid product, anyhow, I am afraid said the bacteriologist to himself, how he gloated on those cultivations of disease germs. A disturbing thought struck him. He turned to the bench by the vapor bath, and then very quickly to his writing table, and he felt hastily in his pockets, and then rushed to the door. I oh, may have put it down on the hall table, he said. Minnie! he shouted hoarsely in the hall. Yes, dear, came a remote voice. Had I anything in my hand when I spoke to you, dear, just now? pause. Nothing, dear, because I remember. Blue ruin, cried the bacteriologist, and incontinently ran to the front door and down the steps of his house to the street. Minnie, hearing the door slam violently, ran in alarm to the window. Down the street, a slender man was getting into a cab. The bacteriologist, hatless and in his carpet slippers, was running and gesticulating wildly towards the group. One slipper came off, but he did not wait for it. He has gone mad, said Minnie. It's that horrid science of his. And opening the window would have called after him. The slender man, suddenly glancing around, seemed struck with the same idea of mental disorder. He pointed hastily to the bacteriologist and said something to the cabman. The apron of the cab slammed, the whip swished, the horse's feet clattered, and in a moment cab and bacteriologist, hotly in pursuit, had receded up the vista of the roadway and disappeared round the corner. Minnie remained straining out of the window for a minute. Then she drew her head back into the room again. She was dumbfounded. Of course, of course he is eccentric, she meditated. But rooting about London in the height of the season, too, in his socks. A happy thought struck her. She hastily put her bonnet on, seized his shoes, went into the hall, took down his hat and light overcoat from the pegs, emerged from the doorstep and hailed a cab that opportunely crawled by. Drive me up the road and round Havelock Crescent, and see if we can find a gentleman running about in a velveteen coat and no hat. 
velveteen coat, ma'am, and no at. Very good, ma'am. And the cabman whipped up at once in the most matter-of-fact way as if he drove to this address every day in his life. Some few minutes later, the little group of cabmen and loafers that collects around the cabman's shelter at Haverstock Hill were startled by the passing of a cab with a ginger-colored screw of a horse driven furiously. They were silent as it went by, and then as it receded, "'That's Airy X, what she got,' said the stout gentleman known as Old Tootles. "'He's a using his whip, he is, to rights,' said the ostler boy. "'Hello,' said poor old Tommy Biles. "'Here's another bloomin' lunatic, blowed of there ain't.' "'It's old George,' said old Tootles, "'and he's driving a lunatic, as you say. "'Ain't he a clawin' out of the keb? "'Wonder if he's after Airy X. The group round the cabman's shelter became animated. Go to it, George! It's a race. Yell, catch him! Whip it! She's a goer, she is, said the ostler boy. Strike me, giddy, cried old Tootles. Here, I'm a-goin' to begin in a minute. Here's another comin'. If all the cabs in Hampstead ain't gotten mad this morning. It's a field mail this time, said the ostler boy. She's a-following him. She's a following him, said old Tootles, usually the other way about. What's she got in her end? Looks like a ayat. What a bloomin' lark it is. Three to one on old George, said the ostler boy. Next. Minnie went by in a perfect roar of applause. She did not like it, but she felt that she was doing her duty and whirled on down Haverstock Hill in Camden Town High Street with her eyes ever intent on the animated back view of old George who was driving her vagrant husband so incomprehensibly away from her. The man in the foremost cab sat crouched in the corner, his arms tightly folded, and the little tube that contained such vast possibilities of destruction gripped in his hand. His mood was a singular mixture of fear and exultation. Chiefly, he was afraid of being caught before he could accomplish his purpose. But behind this was a vaguer but larger fear of the awfulness of his crime but his exaltation far exceeded his fear. No anarchist before him had ever approached this conception of his. Ravicol, val Valiant, all those distinguished persons whose fame he had envied dwindled into insignificance beside him. He had only to make sure of the water supply and break the little tube into a reservoir. How brilliantly he had planned it, forged the letter of introduction, and got into the laboratory, and how brilliantly he had seized his opportunity. The world should hear of him at last. All those people who had sneered at him, neglected him, preferred other people to him, found his company undesirable, should consider him at last. Death, death, death. They had always treated him as a man of no importance. All the world had been in a conspiracy to keep him under. He would teach them yet what it is to isolate a man. What was this familiar street? Great St. Andrew Street, of course. How fared the chase? He craned out of the cab. The bacteriologist was scarcely 50 yards behind. That was bad. He would be caught and stopped yet. He felt in his pocket for money and found half a sovereign. This he thrust up through the trap in the top of the cab into the man's face. More, he shouted. If only we get away. The money was snatched out of his hand. Right you are, said the cabman. And the trap slammed and the lash lay along the glistening side of the horse. The cab swayed, and the anarchist, half standing under the trap, put the hand containing the little glass tube upon the apron to preserve his balance. He felt the brittle thing crack, and the broken half of it rang upon the floor of the cab. He fell back into the seat with a curse and stared dismally at the two or three drops of moisture on the apron. He shuddered. Well, I suppose I shall be the first. Phew. Anyhow... I shall be a martyr. That's something, but it is a filthy death nevertheless. I wonder if it hurts as much as they say. Presently a thought occurred to him. He groped between his feet. A little drop was still in the broken end of the tube, and he drank that to make sure. It was better to make sure. At any rate, he would not fail. Then it dawned upon him there was no further need to escape the bacteriologist. In Wellington Street, he told the cabman to stop and got out. He slipped on the step, and his head felt queer. It was rapid stuff, this cholera poison. He waved his cabman out of existence, so to speak, and stood on the pavement, with his arms folded upon his breast, awaiting the arrival of the bacteriologist. There was something tragic in his pose. 
The sense of imminent death gave him a certain dignity. He greeted his pursuer with a defiant laugh. Viva la anarchy! You are too late, my friend. I have drunk it. The cholera is abroad. The bacteriologist from his cab beamed curiously at him through his spectacles. You have drunk it, an anarchist. I see now. He was about to say something more and then checked himself. A smile hung in the corner of his mouth. He opened the apron of his cab as if to descend, at which the anarchist waved him a dramatic farewell and strode off towards Waterloo Bridge, carefully jostling his infected body against as many people as possible. The bacteriologist was so preoccupied with the vision of him that he scarcely manifested the slightest surprise at the appearance of Minnie upon the pavement with his hat and shoes and overcoat. Oh, very good of you to bring my things, he said, and remained lost in contemplation of the receding figure of the anarchist. You had better get in, he said, still staring. Minnie felt absolutely convinced now that he was mad and directed the cabman home on her own responsibility. Put on my shoes? Uh, Certainly, dear, said he as the cab began to turn and hid the strutting black figure, now small in the distance, from his eyes. Then suddenly something grotesque struck him and he laughed. Then he remarked, It is really very serious, though. You see, that man came to my house to see me, and he is an anarchist. No, don't faint, or I cannot possibly tell you the rest. And I wanted to astonish him, not knowing he was an anarchist, and took up a cultivation of the new species of bacterium I was telling you of, that infest, and I think cause, the blue patches upon various monkeys. And like a fool, I said it was Asiatic cholera, and he ran away with it to poison the water of London, and he certainly might have made things look blue for this civilized city. And now he has swallowed it. Of course, I cannot say what will happen, but you know it turned that kitten blue, and the three puppies, in patches, and the sparrow, bright blue. But the bother is, I shall have all the trouble and expense of preparing some more. Put on my coat on this hot day? Why? Because we might meet Mrs. Jabber? My dear, Mrs. Jabber is not a draft. But why should I wear a coat on a hot day because of Mrs. Oh, very well. The End All right, what a what a fun story that was. Let's walk through it. So at the time that Wells was writing, science was starting to make some major leaps in progress, and they were beginning to understand the power of bacteria uh, and things, especially concerning cholera. Certainly, the elements that the, the main character, the bacteriologist, talked about were true, that if indeed you had a vial, even just one vial of, of this bacteria, you could do great damage by putting it in the water supply or inf- infecting a city with it. The good news and, and kind of the, the, the comedic part of this is that it turns out it wasn't, in fact, a vial of bacteria, of cholera bacteria. It was some kind of potion drug thing that would turn the person, at least it turned the animals blue when they when he gave it to them. Um, so a little bit of a cheat, perhaps a little bit of misdirection but you'll you'll note that earlier in the text, when he sees it's missing, he's he cries out. So remember, he he cries out, "Blue ruin!" and ran out the front door. Uh, you get a little bit of hint, although how would you know, right? Overall, the story there is that tension of how easy it could have been for somebody to poison an entire town. And that's a little scary to think about, and. I would have to imagine that this story kind of made people laugh, but also sit a little uneasily because of just like, like I said, how quickly the, the bottle or the, the vial was stolen and how quickly it could have been used to infect an entire city. My favorite part without question is kind of in the middle of the story when you've got the anarchist flying by in his, in his cab the bacteriologist is chasing him and then the wife is chasing her husband. And you've got the, uh, the, the old man and a couple other young boys um, commenting on it like it's a race and taking bets as to who's going to catch whom first. Uh, it was just really fun. And it was fun to read. So in the end, we find out that the bacteriologist was lying because perhaps he wanted attention. He wanted glory. He wanted somebody to, to be impressed with what he was doing. 
and the anarchist perhaps wanted the same thing and he was content to be a martyr. Probably, although there is some room for doubt, what's going to happen is the next morning he's going to wake up and he's going to be covered in, in blue spots or he's going to be blue himself. And perhaps he will have infected other people and, and they'll wake up tomorrow and be blue. Who knows? It's funny to think about, but in the end, you can breathe a sigh of relief because the city was not in danger after all. But why I, I chose to read this is, first of all, because of how not only how funny it was, but also the clever way that H.G. Wells pulls you into the story. You're like halfway through. I'm thinking this is going to end horribly. It's going to be like a, a tragic twist ending with the town you know, being killed and by, by cholera and the scientist is going to feel guilty. It's going to be some kind of a, a message against being careful about playing with these powers, you know, this power to hold in our hands, the, the, the a power to wipe out a civilization, uh, you know, that science enables us to, to possess. And then Wells twists it on its head and it's just something funny with maybe some more serious re repercussions, but overall it was, uh, it was much ado about nothing, I suppose, as Shakespeare would say. But I love how Wells just manipulates your emotions and in the plot like that. It is really, really a fun story. So I was, uh, I was happy to bring it to you today. Well, that'll be all for today's edition of Victorian Shorts. And then just a reminder, I will be typically posting these on the third Wednesdays of every month. Uh, this month I'm a, a bit late because of Christmas and New Year's and a lot of the activities happening uh, near the uh, beginning of the, of the new year. But third or fourth Wednesdays, I'll be putting them out. So I look forward to the story I will bring you next month. I'm sure it'll be another classic one. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and would like to. And uh, we'll talk more about uh, these stories in episodes to come. And so until next time, happy reading and take care.